Okay, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our final speaker of the morning, James Schreiner, who teaches systems engineering at the United States Military Academy at West Point. As a U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, he served over 20 years on active duty in Korea, Kuwait, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Jim earned his PhD in Industrial and Enterprise Systems Engineering, and today he's going to discuss capacity development and invasive species, and I would also like to say he is generally just a badass. So let's welcome Jim. There you go. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, and I'm the last person holding everyone up to lunch. Okay, so, so that's the, the downside. The, the good side is I have a fish story. If we're talking water policy and systems thinking, you've got to end it off with a fish story uh, before the end of uh, uh, super lunch. Uh, thank you all, Laura, Derek, uh, for the invitation. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jim Schreiner. I'm a program director at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, I run what's called the Core Engineering Sequence Program for Systems Engineering. In other words, every cadet at West Point has, uh, who is not an engineer, or about 60% of our total population, still has to choose an engineering curriculum to where they take three courses in civil or mechanical or environmental or systems. And so systems is where I fit in. And so over the course of the three courses that we teach, uh, which start off with a uh, design course uh, in the intermediate, uh, we talk methods, so deterministic stochastic modeling, life cycle costing, uh, decision analysis type techniques, uh, and then it culminates with a real world client wicked problem that they have to solve with, with a client ranging from Lockheed Martin projects uh, all the way to the towns here in New York working with mayors on key infrastructure uh, decision making. But we start all that out in our design course with a block on systems thinking. And so as an army guy, I have plenty of stories, lots of war stories, right? And I'm always willing to share those with my cadets. And so I, the, the pedagogical approach that I take in the classroom often is to bring forward uh, those very vignettes in my career that may apply to systems thinking of which uh, there are plenty of wicked problems and some would say my life is a wicked problem. Uh, but nonetheless, there are a lot of patterns that underlie these wicked problems that we could dissect. And so looking at the diversity of the problem sets brings a lot of life into the classroom and, and really I think is a great technique uh, to, to bring home the importance of looking at these patterns that evolve or these rules that we should be thinking about as we uh, proceed. Uh, for every engineer or for every cadet at the United States Military Academy, there are going to eventually be officers in the Army. They are going to fall under a basic doctrinal principle called mission command, which means that we recognize the uncertainty of the world around them. We empower them to decide, act, and adapt those actions on the spot within the guidelines of the commander's intent. Sounds a lot like systems thinking to me. In fact, really, if you, if you dissect the components of our basic doctrinal mission command focus, systems thinking uh, really bleeds throughout the entire process. And so with that, I'm going to share two quick vignettes. Uh, in 2007, 2008, I was an operations officer in, uh, in southern Iraq, uh, responsible for freedom of movement, security operations, partnership with Iraqi security forces, as well as this thing called capacity development. What is capacity development? For every bit of infrastructure, for every bit of training that we might do uh, in, in a province or in a municipality in, in, within a province, how do we build the capacity so that they those people could sustain themselves long after we're gone. No intent to stay there. So, so how do we, if we are going to uh, talk to them and lead them through resourcing new irrigation projects, how do they go about sustaining those irrigation projects uh, as subsistence farmers, as one small example. And so if you peel back the onion on this, uh, military, we love our line and block charts. We love our line, logical lines of operation, we call them. But at its root, if I reflect on, on the efforts that we did and the campaign plan that's shown up here, there were a number of very unique activities from running combat operations to opening schools and handing out soccer balls and building that trust with, with the population. So how do we turn the switch 
from a combat-oriented counterinsurgency focus to uh, a humanitarian effort or a capacity development effort. And the way you do that is you draw distinctions. Every activity that we uh, accomplished, we would draw a boundary around what we were doing. And it wasn't, you know, the Army's real good at executing. Give us a mission, we execute, right? Uh, that's what we're known for. However, understanding what that system is not is equally important. Uh, and so understanding the second, third order effects, drawing the distinction between what we are trying to achieve and how other efforts might augment or fit within that. And so that leads us logically to thinking of this as a system. If we were, uh, for example, building capacity in a township, which was one of our main focuses, we would teach them project management principles, how to manage cities, small municipalities, from electric grids to uh, reverse osmosis water purification units. We would do that on a day in, day out basis, but how did it fit? within provincial leadership? How did it fit at the national level? And that was part of our challenge. So we had to take a systems thinking, uh, understanding where the fit of our system uh, was. Of course, to do that, we had to build relationships, a lot of them. Uh, in order to build those relationships, we had to look at ourselves, take an introspective look at what we were trying to accomplish and figure out what our actions were going to create. What was the equal and opposite reaction in many cases that we may see from the population, from tribes, from our enemy. We had to do that on a day in, day out basis. And the only way you could do that is if you gain the perspectives of those in that system. So uh, a key deliberate part of our efforts was key leader engagements. And so we'd go out and we'd meet with local tribesmen. Uh, we would go out and meet with the elected officials. So we could understand the tribal layers, the elected official layers, the sectarian layers. If you didn't understand that and have the perspectives, then a lot of those actions you took uh, may, in fact, not uh, go as well as you think. And so what does that have to do with the Great Lakes? Fast forward from 20, uh, 2007 Iraq to 2011, 2012 Chicago. I'm the deputy commander uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers in Chicago at that time. And we're sitting on this just wonderful jewel of a natural resource called the Great Lakes. Uh, Great Lakes is an incredibly complex uh, ecosystem uh, bounded on the south by eight different states, two uh, provinces in Canada to the north. Uh, and so the Corps of Engineers, our charter is to uh, facilitate navigation, ease of navigation along our waterway system. That is our fundamental uh, baseline charter. But we do a lot of other things. And so we were looking at shoreline uh, erosion protection in many cases. We were looking at flood risk management. And so a lot of these communities in many of these states uh, have uh, huge flood risks when you have uh, significant rainfalls. And then the last element, uh, the line of operation that is very uh, not, not well understood is environmental. Uh, we have a huge environmental program and Chicago is well known as kind of the hub, uh, really a, a, a hub for understanding of, of intellectual capital, uh, so to speak, across the core for environmental restoration projects. Uh, with that, the poster child for invasive species under our environmental branch is the Asian carp. The Asian carp is a voracious eater. Uh, it has been known to go into uh, the Mississippi and the Illinois rivers and really just drain the ecosystem. They are not a natural predator. Um, however, uh, they will, in fact, eat out uh, much of the, the ecosystem within these rivers driving out native species. So it's a big threat and there's a very uh, firm concern that in fact, if they did make it into the Great Lakes, that it would ruin the commercial, recreational, and, and, and then harm a lot of our already uh, endangered species in, in that ecosystem. The reason this is, exists is because there was never once a natural continuous aquatic pathway between the Great Lakes watershed and the uh, Mississippi River watershed until the Chicago Sanitary and Shipping Canal was created back in 1900. It was created because of water quality issues in a rapidly expanding uh, population of Chicago. From about 1 million people in 1900 to about nine plus million right now. And so we took the same approach. We created distinctions. Anything that we would do um, with respect to stopping the invasive species from moving up the Illinois River towards the Great Lakes, was done in the context of the other 
things that this system was performing for us to include navigation. It's a lot of barge traffic that goes between the two watersheds to include flood risk management. If you don't have this reversal of the rivers, guess what? Chicago's on a flood plain. You're going to see hundreds of millions of dollars of damage every year because of flooding events. And so we created those distinctions around what we were doing for the invasive species. We understood it fit within the other systems, uh, the other systems encompassing wastewater treatment, flood risk management, navigation in particular. And then we built the partnerships, right? We, we identified what our actions, what the reactions might be to our infrastructure builds. Uh, and of course, you did that by gaining perspectives of multiple folks. We had a great organization called the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. Uh, this is us up in Toronto to gain that binational perspective as well. And so you figured out the relationships, you built the perspectives. And so what? You know, how do we go from uh, running combat operations to I caught a fish this big? It's about the commonality, commonalities. It's the patterns of system thinking that pervade and create the mental models that we need to act independently and make smart decisions. So with that, I look forward to your questions later and uh, thank you very much.